If uh, people could take their seats, we'll get going. So I'd like to welcome everybody to the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law. My name is Frank Fukuyama. I'm the Mossbacher Director uh, of that center. Uh, what we're doing today is a little bit changed because you might have noticed that Ukraine has been in the news a bit this past <laughs> week. So this is a, a, an event we've had every year now for the last three years to introduce our new class of Ukrainian emerging leaders, and we're going to do that. Uh, but we've tailored the program a little bit to talk a little bit about Ukraine uh, uh, in a way that might uh, be helpful uh, to those of you that are thinking about the current uh, issues uh, in Washington and Kiev and um, may be confused. So uh, I would like to, uh, and, and I should just say a little bit about the program. So this is, a, this is the third year of this program. Each year we have brought three uh, mid-career uh, rising leaders. The first two classes I think have done extraordinarily well and you're gonna be hearing from one of them, uh, Sasha Ustinova, who's come back. Uh, uh, to talk to you today, uh, but we're really very pleased uh, at the success of this program and we're very glad uh, that you could be here to, um, you know, hear from our new uh, Ukrainians. So I'd like to ask Mike McFall, the director of the Freeman Spogli Institute, to come up and say a few words. Okay. There's no reason to clap for me. Um, you should clap for our Ukrainians. I just want to just echo what Frank said. This program, uh, we did not anticipate that there would be so much news about Ukraine uh, this week. Um, and for me, that, that means I'm busy and I'll be popping in and out because I'm talking about this on the media right now. Uh, but I do think it underscores why this program is so important, by the way. Uh, there's a lot of misconceptions in the news about Ukraine. Uh, yeah, people are laughing. You know that there are. Um, uh, and there is a story that is not being told about Ukraine. And I was just literally on TV uh, about a few, uh, last hour trying to remind people that Ukraine is not just about corruption. Ukraine is not just about Giuliani and Shokin and Lutsenko. That there's another Ukraine. Sorry? Well, he thinks he is. Uh, fair enough, Slav. Fair enough. There's another part of the story, and that's the part of the story that, that we're here to celebrate, that people are trying to build a different kind of Ukraine, fighting, Ukraine, uh, fighting corruption, not being a participant in it. And I think it just underscores the wisdom of this program, including the founders are all here, and Frank will, will talk about it in a minute, that if we want a better relationship between the United States and Ukraine, and we want to see Ukraine succeed as a sovereign country and as a democracy, this is exactly the kind of program uh, that, that Stanford should be doing. And I'm really honored that we are a part of it here at FSI. Uh, and it's great that people flew in from Ukraine, from Kiev, to be with us today. You're going to hear from them in a minute, and I'll turn it back over to have Frank introduce them. Thank you all for coming. Uh, so next, I'd like to um, introduce Slava Vakarchuk. Slava was a faculty guest. Uh, the first year of the program. Uh, he was one of the original uh, donors and supporters of it. Uh, those of you from Ukraine don't need an introduction to him, but he's now entered the political scene with the Golos party uh, that's entered the parliament. So Slava, floor is yours. It's not the rock concert yet, so. <laughs> but, I, but I enjoy uh, screening. <laughs> Uh, first of all, usually I say it's a great honor for me to be here, but it's, it will be very official to say that. I would say I'm happy to be back home, and it's absolutely amazing uh, feeling when you see familiar faces, familiar walls, uh, familiar and very warm energy and vibe that I always will remember that kind of rules here. And uh, this is an institution you want to be it. And my short speech will be delivered to our new Ukrainian emerging leaders first, because that's 
they are the most important people today here because they are uh, the reason we make it all. And it's the third cohort of the program now. So six of yours already back in Ukraine and they participate in Ukrainian political and civil society life. Uh, one of them, I think she will be taking a floor afterwards is my peer uh, in the parliament, member of our party. Uh, some of them are working for government. Some of them, of them are very vocal in civil activity. And I'm really happy that Ukrainian Emerging Leaders Program helps a lot. And on behalf of all Ukrainians and on behalf of all enthusiasts and, and found Founding, founding brothers and sisters of this program, I really want to thank, first of all, to FSI and to Mike McFall for making it happen. <laughs> to a director of CDRL, uh, our favorite, Frank Fukuyama. Thank you. <laughs> to a wonderful and enthusiastic couple of Ukrainians, to uh, our Sasha and Alexander Kimenko, please. Katya and Sasha, can you complete? So these are, these are people who made it happen. And now just a little bit of politics, but no politics in the extent that you probably expect from me, not here, not today. Uh, Want to leave this, uh, let's say, uh, impartial. But you know that in Ukraine and generally in the world, there are a lot of interesting and sometimes worrisome developments and we see that all these rules and all these you know principles which western democratic society uh, is embodied are now under threat we know that uh, you will you guys you will have privilege and i also think a real pleasure to read uh, all these wonderful books written by frank by Professor Larry Diamond, who is here, by others, uh, great scholars from Stanford and all over the world, in which you will be mostly told that the most important things for making some country prosperous are institutions and rules. Remember this famous book by uh, Achmoglu and Robinson, when the uh, white nations fail, when they say, it's very simple. It's about institutions, sustainable institutions, and those, if they are robust and if they work, they make your country prosperous, successful, and sustainable. If you don't have institutions, if you don't have rules, if you don't have principles which are established and then uh, remain stable for generations, that's very unlikely that you will succeed. Frank teaches it in, your, in, in his lectures. You can hear it from Mike, you can hear it from Larry, you can hear it from everybody, from Eric here, Jensen, from everybody here. And now Ukraine is, has a challenge because there are many people in Ukraine now who want to make the country a better place, just replacing people and not building and strengthening institutions. This is a very worrisome sign. Uh, and I think even a year at Stanford, sometimes it's not, it's not enough to understand that your temptation to use the wind of an opportunity, keeping aside rules and institutions, uh, this temptation is very high and it's very difficult to stand against it. But I urge you, always remember that institutions, rules and principles are a way better, maybe a way more difficult, but a way better and a way more efficient way to build our country a better place, to build it prosperous, to build it successful. Institutions and principles, and not political reason. This is one tip I want to give you. I got it at Stanford. Hope you'll keep it with you for all your life, and I wish you successful to newer here and staying and make some noise. <laughs> uh, so next, uh, I would like to acknowledge the um, 
the different uh, groups and donors that have made the Emerging Leaders Program uh, possible. Uh, these are Thomas Fiala of Dragon Capital, uh, Victor and Irina Ivanchik, um, the Believe in Yourself Foundation, uh, Alexander Kosovan from McPaw, uh, Luminate, um, uh, and our great Elena Boitson, who has been uh, very helpful to us. Rustem, uh, Umar Rustem, is he in the room? Yeah, Rustem um, uh, from the uh, uh, Astem Foundation, uh, Slava Vakarchuk, uh, the Western NIS uh, Enterprise Fund. Uh, so we're really, really extremely grateful to all of these individuals and groups for the uh, assistance that they've given us. And I want to uh, uh, join Slava in thanking Alexander and Katerina Akimenko, founders of the program, who, whose idea it was and whose tireless work you know, has really made this all possible. So thanks to everybody there. <laughs> Uh, so next, I would like to ask um, uh, Sasha Ustinova to come up. She is a current member of parliament in the Golos party uh, and a member of the law enforcement committee. Previously, before she came to Stanford, uh, she had been a part of ANTAC, the Anti-Corruption uh, Action Center, one of the leading anti-corruption NGOs, and therefore an expert on uh, corruption in uh, Ukraine. So Sasha, please. Thanks, Frank. But now being a politician, I'd rather be an expert in anti-corruption, not corruption, because <laughs> it's gonna be, I can end up very sad. Well, dear guests and colleagues, it's, it's a really great honor for me to be standing here and talking in front of you, because I remember myself sitting here a year ago, because we're all sitting. Now you have to give a TED talk, and talking about the efforts of Ukraine in fighting corruption. And the expectations we had for the upcoming elections, for the upcoming presidential and parliamentary elections. And now, a year ago, I'm standing here talking in front of you, and we have already had elections. We have the new president, we have the new parliament, and I'm very honored to be a part of this new uh, parliament of Ukraine. And uh, I'm now in the new role, not, of, not just an anti-corruption activist, but also the member of the law enforcement committee of the parliament. Um, I also remember about half a year ago, I was given a speech together with Kleptocracy Initiative based in Washington DC about on how corruption goes cross borders and how odious corrupt state officials, especially from Ukraine, are trying to wash off their reputation by investing not only in expensive property abroad, but also in think tanks and even politicians here in the United States. And as we see recently, it had become a scandal and we understood that uh, our internal corruption issues can turn out into a huge scandal abroad and a huge international scandal. And this scandal might involve even the first people of the countries as we see so far. But what lacks in these scandals are the facts. The truths and facts and understanding of people who is the bad guy and who is the good guy. It lacks justice in the news because news very often misinterpret and misunderstand what actually is going on in the countries and how uh, the corruption scandals that should be actually capped inside Ukraine become well known outside the country. Unfortunately, these scandals form the public opinion of not only state officials but ordinary people in the United States, not only about the state officials of my country but also about what Ukraine is. You know, when I read the American president saying, because I heard you had a prosecutor who was very good and he was shut down and that's really unfair, it is really unfair to read that. And it makes me feel injustice to the bottom of my heart. Why? Because back then I was an anti-corruption activist and I remember I was organizing demonstrations about these fair guys, about these fair ex-general prosecutors who are now being misinterpreted as good guys who were trying to investigate other top officials from other countries. Uh, I can tell you these guys are not good. I can tell you that the former prosecutor, Mr. Shocking, who is now being misinterpreted as a good guy, is unfortunately, uh, was actually fired not just because 
I don't know, ex-Vice President Biden told Mr. Poroshenko to do that. But because I myself organized tons of demonstrations in front of the general prosecutor's office and the whole civil society, the lawyers, everybody in our country was pushing hard for our president to fire Mr. Shocking for what he was doing. Just for you to understand, it was not about, it was not about the investigation on Mr. Zlochevsky only. Shocking, our former general prosecutor Shocking was the guy who helped Zlochevsky escape the prosecution. He helped Zlochevsky to unfreeze 23 million dollars on his accounts in the United Kingdom. They found a loop in the Ukrainian legislation on how this was clearly done. And now we see that he is being treated as a victim. The second ex-general prosecutor, Mr. Lutsenko, that was also mentioned ab abroad is not a good guy either. I can tell you just one fact that probably each one of you will understand. He has been in politics and in the government for the last, I don't know, like 20, 25 years, probably his whole life. This person has a mansion of almost 300,000 feet in one of the most expensive suburbs of Kyiv. I'm not gonna mention all the other expensive property that f his family owns. Well, that's a very uh, common thing in Ukraine to uh, have very, um, I would say, uh, businesswoman wives uh, or um, uh, father-in-law that owns the majority of the property. And that's what happened to Lutsenko. And that's why see, seeing them being treated as victims now, I understand that this is one of the new challenges my country is facing today. A challenge to show the facts, the real facts, without any misinterpretation abroad for Americans and for the whole international society to understand what was really going on. Not to be, not, for these facts not to be misinterpreted or misunderstood. For Ukraine not to be involved in any political games abroad. But the good thing in this story is we have so many brilliant people, even here sitting today, who can tell the facts, who can take this information out. Because if we don't, we're gonna have the new kleptocracy system formed. When these people can not only steal and invest abroad, but when these people can end up being victims just because of the international scandals and just because of the politics, this should not be done. That's why I am very honored today to be standing here and seeing all these people who can go out and give this information, give these facts. And you know, I remember when I was at Stanford, one of the words I would hear mostly probably, well, of course, besides innovation, is impact. And I can tell you that this program probably has the biggest impact, not only for us as alumni, but for Ukraine itself, as any other program I've seen in Ukraine or outside. We have so far six alumni, and we have a special, I would say, Stanford community already formed inside Ukraine, not only of alumni, but people related to Stanford as well. We can see Slava was just standing here and Rustem Vmerov and me being in the same fraction in the parliament, changing the country ourselves. We have Dima Romanovich, who was an alumni uh, a year before me, who is now the deputy minister in the Ministry of Economy. And it's so much easier to talk and negotiate because we came to the same classes that Fran gave us and we know what the institutions are and how we have to fight for it. And it makes it so much easier to come to the compromise and conclusion. We have... Uh, Lesa Matvichuk, who is supporting and fighting for our war prisoners and our um, political prisoners who are now kept in Russia. And you know, recently we had 33 people who were uh, brought back to Ukraine. And frankly speaking, when I saw that plane uh, landing in Borispol, Kiev, in Kiev Borispol airport with all these people on board, I was literally crying and I was thinking of her because I know how much time she devoted for it. Even here studying at Stanford, she would chat with me or other people at two in the morning because she still knew that these people were captured and they were held in, uh, they were held in uh, Moscow and she was doing her best to release them. But you know, I was, uh, I was supposed to um, uh, introduce the new cohort and I was giving just like all of you uh, their uh, biographies. Frankly speaking, when I look at them and when I came to know them closer, I understand that the next cohort 
every year is the brighter and the brighter one. It just, they're amazing people, and it is so sad we have to shut it, like to cut it down to such a short biography, but let me introduce Katerina Bonder. She, uh, she was a member of the reform support team at the Ministry of Finance. You will, prob you will probably read a lot about her being involved in the pension reform, in the social um, sphere of uh, the Minister of Finance. But the thing you probably wouldn't know about her, and she wouldn't mention it in her biography, is that's the person who was actually holding all the negotiations with IMF for Ukraine. And that's the person who was keeping IMF in Ukraine, and trust me, we would go bankrupt without that. So thank you for that, and let me introduce Katya. The second person is Artem Romanikov. Well, I know Artem back when I was an anti-corruption activist. <laughs> and Artem was uh, a co-founder and the chairman of the uh, anti-corruption um, NGO called Civil Control Platform in the Dnipro City. You know, I have the deepest respect for people fighting corruption as activists in the regions. Because it is easier for us on the national level because we have publicity, we have support from the media, we have sometimes even support from the, uh, some of the politicians. But people in the regions don't have this support. They're being attacked, they're being beaten up. We have, more than, we have 63 people who had been already beaten up or attacked of activists in Ukraine in the regions. And the majority of their stories had never been heard. So I have the deepest respect for what they're doing and let me introduce our time and he will probably introduce himself later. And the third uh, person I would like to introduce today is Pavel Rzesh. He's the co-founder and creator. <laughs> Pavel is the co-founder and creative director of Banda Agency. And you know, that was the first time I <coughs> saw personally, a, a, personally a person who actually won the Cannes Lions Festival. And I mean, I think this is just something, I, I always thought you could see these people only on TV, but now I can see him <laughs> sitting here and actually I got to, inter uh, I, was, uh, I was introduced to him as well. But uh, a lot of people in Ukraine, and I really hope it's gonna change abroad as well, know Pavel and their agency for actually creating the first brand of Ukraine called Ukraine Now. All the stickers that you might see if you come to Ukraine, all the billboards with the Ukraine now invest, Ukraine now support, this is what they have developed. And I'm very proud to introduce him, and I hope he will talk more about uh, what he's gonna plan, uh, what he's planning to do in Stanford. Thank you so much. So now it's part when we're supposed to introduce ourselves. I'll just explain why <laughs> we have this small <laughs> technical issue. Creativity issue, yes. We're in the, we're in the Silicon Valley, so it's innovation the everywhere. The yeah. Tell him, tell him the truth, <laughs> the truth from Slava. <laughs> uh, so, uh, is the clicker working? Okay, <laughs> so probably I'll start. So how it all started? Well, this is me, actually. <laughs> and you know, many people are saying that when I think about very serious things, my face is still the same, but <laughs> <laughs> I would like to start with a dream. Huh? It's less <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm trying to smile. <laughs> so, but I'll start with a dream. My childhood dream was to pilot the biggest planes. Well, although it might seem quite strange for a girl, actually, but I'm thinking about this right now. And actually, what I do every day is quite similar to this dream. So I'm almost there, actually. <laughs> well. But let's get back to, to the presentation itself. I was born in Donetsk. Let me draw your attention. It's the uh, eastern part of Ukraine. <laughs> in 2006, I moved to Kiev, where I entered the University of International Relations and graduated in 2012. Well, what happened next? Unexpectedly, I moved to Singapore. 
I spent there one and a half year and I've been working, traveling throughout Asia, everywhere. And it was really a fantastic and amazing part of my life. It's just a wonderful period. Well, but everything good sometimes finishes and I had to get back to Ukraine. I started in banking sector. It's a big uh, French bank, banking group. I saw their bank here as well, you have it. Uh, but frankly speaking, it was quite boring, so I switched to Microsoft. I thought it's gonna be an IT company. It's very interesting, it's very exciting. Yes, I was right, but there was a revolution of dignity. It happened, and uh, the country manager of Microsoft of that time became the deputy head of presidential administration, and he invited a couple of people from Microsoft to work on reforms agenda, and I was among them. So this was the point when I thought, well, probably this is my chance to do something good for the country. And I accepted the offer and became a part of project management office at the presidential administration. I continued my work at the Ministry of Finance, as Sasha has already said, I was responsible for social reforms, which includes uh, pension reform. And yes, I managed the negotiation process uh, with the IMF at that time, and we successfully completed the program. And after this, I was consulting the PwC office in Ukraine in their projects in public sector. So, actually talking about my achievements. The pension reform, it's a, you know, it's a very sensitive topic in Ukraine because it deals with people who vote for our politicians, and this is why it's very, touchy topic, you know, uh, <laughs> actually, because any manipulation you make with the pension system, it influences our pensioners, and politicians are trying to avoid this thing. But at that point of time, it was almost a crisis with the pension, pension fund budget, and this is how we decided that this is the time to make this reform happen. So we have 12 million of pensioners, and almost all of them got the increase in their pensions and well it was a real success acknowledged from all our international partners world bank imf etc so the next achievement i would say mm, uh, it's um, creation of social payments verification system okay again it sounds quite complicated but just for your information in ukraine one third of state budget is devoted to social payments and we had kind of idea that something is wrong in this sphere because our expenditures are too high and you know all these problems with internally displaced persons and probably fraud existing there. So we decided to check this part of our expenditures. We developed a concept which was approved by the government and um, this system, it's a very sophisticated IT tool. It's under development now and um, I hope it will bring a lot of savings to our budget. And yes, of course, the IMF program fulfillment, <laughs> this is how we avoided the default, which I <laughs> suppose quite a good <laughs> achievement as well. Okay, so what happened next? I don't think that it needs any comments. <laughs> it's obvious. I'm here at Stanford in front of you. And um, yeah, so. Uh, what I would like to tell you more about is what am I going to do here? I think you all probably mentioned this strange red line at the bottom of all slides, right? I'm going to explain. This is my interest in innovations. <laughs> it started somewhere in the middle of Singapore period of my life because when you stay in Singapore, it's a highly innovative high-tech environment and innovations are everywhere and you just can't resist to get infected with this virus, you know? And no matter where I walked, where I worked, what experiences I had, projects and everything, innovation was there. So I was trying to implement and develop and launch some initiatives to boost innovation in Ukraine or those organizations where I was. So, you know, it, it really became my passion. And for the past two years, we were working closely with the government and we, are trying, we were trying to develop the innovative ecosystem of Ukraine, working in terms of policy making. And we actually launched a couple of successful 
initiatives like a startup fund, the Innovation Council, but it's not enough as of now. So logically, what I'm going to do here is work on development of Ukraine's innovation policy. Because Ukraine's innovation ecosystem, for me, looks like this as of now. We have some kind of separate elements. Don't try to read what is written there. So I just wanted to show that they are not interconnected. They're just separate. They exist somehow. Don't have any international exposure or it's so small that we can't even mention it. And this, how I want it to be. Actually, any good innovation ecosystem looks like this. It has a lot of actors, it has a lot of elements, they are all interconnected, they're exposed to the whole world, including the Silicon Valley. So this is the ultimate goal of my project here. But all this would be impossible without a key value for me. And the key value is people. The people who support me, the people who contribute into me personally, into my success, into my projects, who make all this happen. And actually, this slide is too small <laughs> for everyone to fit in it, <laughs> but never mind. Uh, I'm very thankful to all these people who supported me throughout my way and path here. But circumstances change, time goes, sometimes continents change, and now, I hope you recognize these people, right? <laughs> it's you, actually. And I hope that together we can build something very cool, create new projects, discuss new opportunities, new ideas, and contribute to Ukrainian development all together. So feel free to contact me. I'm happy to discuss with you all your ideas, any creative, unusual approaches, everything, please, I don't know, take a picture, write it down, or just find me on Facebook, whatever. I'm open and happy to talk to each of you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, and now I would like to invite Pavel Vrzesh, <laughs> was it nice, <laughs> to the stage for him to introduce himself, my co-fellow, a very, Creative one, please. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My oh, it's me. Okay. <laughs> My name is Pavel Zhezh. I'm the co-founder of a creative agency in Kiev called Banda. If you spell my surname in English, it consists eight consonants and only one liter E. <laughs> but what, what interesting, no matter where you will put this E, it still will be Vrzesh. <laughs> it's hard to make mistakes, don't worry. Um, that's me was shooted by professional photographer for Stanford's press release. And that's me uh, was shot uh, by my father at the age when I didn't know what Stanford is. I have been in communication industry for 15 years. Uh, just after the school, I left my small home village Jankoy in Crimea and went to Kiev alone. I was small, I was afraid, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. Likely, I met some smart and talented people who influenced me to become creative. So, uh, seven years ago, I decided to start my own creative agency. I wanted to put a human-centric approach in the core of our project and our agency culture. It worked and still works. Uh, through these years, we realized more than two, 200 projects in 17 different markets, included Spain, Austria, Sweden, and of course Ukraine. Ukraine is our main market. And recently we have, have done a very big and important project, the brand of the country Ukraine now. It was hard. Working with government is really hard. 
but hard but rewarding. The result was significant. Let's look. Why does Ukraine need branding so badly? A global study showed that top associations with Ukraine today are corruption, revolution, and military conflict. We're aggressive, Ukraine is in a mess. People are confused and tangled. Think about corruption and bribes. You just think of uh, revolution, which isn't great, right? New Ukraine needed a new voice. But what can we tell the world to change the perception of the country and yet stay true to ourselves? We were given freedom to create something bold, to show another Ukraine. Young, optimistic, vibrant. Ukraine that lives right now. Now became our key message. It's a powerful word representing the spirit of modern Ukrainians. They do not wait. They build, launch, and develop the next big things right now. We created a flexible identity. It's dynamic. Whenever we speak, it adapts to the context. The style is so recognizable that it works in any variation. We constructed a custom typeface inspired by the works of Ukrainian constructivist Vasil Ermolov. To make the new brand significant and really noticed, we needed participation of every Ukrainian to whom it really matters. So that's why we provided online tools to promote Ukraine and personalize branding. It gained massive support. People created their personal messages, told about their businesses and hobbies, and the brand immediately became the point of national discussion. So, so the branding in a, in a perfect way actually demonstrates Ukraine as a, as a nation which overcame difficulties in a very positive, positive, strong spirit. And what happened in the last few years is, is incredible. It's, it's like the birth of a nation. Thank you. Um, my agency won the Cannes Lions. It's most prestigious advertising award globally. And getting a Cannes Lions, it's like a getting an Oscar if you are a film director from Ukraine. And what even most fantastically, I think, we become agency of the year at the Red Dot Design Award. Our project competed with 8,000 works from 52 countries. And it was the first time in history when an agency from an emerging country got this title, Agency of the Year. I think uh, we, we did some impossible in an emerging market without big budget, without big brand's name, without good education. We create one of the best agency, creative agencies in the world. It's kind of magic. I call it Ukrainian magic. Yeah, it's, uh, unfortunately we don't have modern creative education in Ukraine right now. That's why we founded four years ago Kiev Academy of Media Arts. Here we teach creativity, communication strategy, art direction, copywriting, design. Uh, we had, have now for 5,000 graduates and celebrity lecturers from all around the world come to our academy to inspire and teach our students. This is Stefan Zygmaster, it's legendary graphic designer from New York. Or this is Frank Boren, he is director of Red Holy Chili Pepper, Duran Duran, Hertz music videos. So it's really, really cool to have the, such guys. Um, and now with our agency, we will have very ambitious mission. We want to make Ukraine creatively normal worldwide. We believe that the more companies and state institutions will use creative approach to solve the issues, the faster our economy will grow.
Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, during my time at Stanford, I'll be working on the project dedicated to find a way how to in implement modern technologies and creativity in order to help governmental institutions to communicate their actions and messages effectively. <coughs> Definitely the question of communication one of the main topics in Ukrainian politics right now. At every meetup of reformers or public talk or panel discussion, they all say the problem number one is communication or bad quality of it. Government just can't communicate with people. They explain their strategy and actions badly. As a result, there is everyone hates politicians, they hate each other, and as a result, potentially good reforms don't get enough of support. As uh, you say, the research said that 34% uh, of Ukrainians reacted negatively to reforms last year. And only 2%, only 2% expressed positive attitudes to the reform, to the reforms. Yeah, it sounds sad, actually. It's really sad. And I want to change this. I want to implement uh, principles of uh, communication industry into government communications. I think the good communication should be addressed to the whole stakeholders. It should be policy communication, not political one. And it's hard to do. It's really hard and big challenge, and that's good. That's where we can implement our Ukrainian magic. Yeah, I have always been Ukrainian oriented and very positive about its future. I think Ukraine is changing fast, and there is a lot of opportunities to lead this change. <coughs> Thank you, please free, write me something and, or call. And now I want to welcome on stage Artyom Romanyuk, my co-fellow. Thank you. It was a good treat just to turn on a video. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have one, so. Uh, my name is Artem Romanikov. Hello, everybody. And uh, I'm from Dnipro, Ukraine. And I put this, uh, uh, the name of my hometown to the slide because uh, I'm the only person uh, here, the only participant of the program uh, who is not from Kiev, actually. Uh, so I'm uh, kind of proud of it also. And Maybe, we will see. <laughs> so, um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my background because uh, I guess this is the thing that led me here and that, uh, um, and this is why I was selected to be here actually. So basically my life is divided in two pieces. So one is before 2014 and another is after 2014. Uh, why 2014? Because uh, you probably know that uh, in 2013 and 14, Ukraine survived through a revolution of dignity and it changed our lives dramatically and mine too. So if before 2014, my life looked like this blue, narrow and uh, like a flat line, after 2014, it became <laughs> something like this. And as you can see, this red dot uh, high above is, uh, is not your red dot award, but <laughs> it's Stanford, yeah. And I'm here, and I'm very happy that it happened. So actually, what was before this mark, this 2014? Um, you can believe it or not, but this is me. Uh, <laughs> What is more, this is me on my uh, driver's license. So and <laughs> yeah, it's like switch. So <laughs> so um, and policemen in Ukraine, you know, somehow they continue to recognize me by this photo because I show this driver's license even here. I haven't shown it here, but still. Uh, so it works and uh, I was a kind of usual teenager and uh, I, I entered university, I studied math, I studied physics, radio physics, mechanics, mathematics, and uh, mm, 
I never knew, I couldn't even imagine that I'll become a kind of public person. Well, I was a little bit used to publicity because uh, just a uh, usual teenager, I played a guitar in one of Ukrainian rock bands. Of course, Slava, not <laughs> that famous <laughs> as your band. You probably don't even know how to, the name of this one, but. Two of us are physicists, two of us playing in rock band, two of us were at Stanford. So it's like, it's not a Co coincidence. <laughs> coincidence, just a coincidence. <laughs> Okay, I ran my business, I ran my band, I, uh, I, ran, I, did even, I even did some research, I have even several patents in Ukraine for this research, but, uh, and everything was clear to me, but it came to 2014, and it really changed my life. So I quit my business, I left it, I left my um, researches, and I almost left music, but... Don't do it. <laughs> thank you. And uh, now I'm running two uh, uh, civil society organizations in Ukraine. First one is Civil Control Platform. Second one is uh, Save Dnipro. And uh, uh, as for Civil Control Platform, it deals with issues of anti-corruption, uh, advocacy of reforms, and uh, civil society development. And uh, we began with a, as a small regional initiative, and then we spread our activities nationwide. And uh, after this, we started uh, implementation of uh, one of the most successful reforms in Ukraine, it's public procurement reform. We started implementing it uh, at the local level in several regions of Ukraine. And this is a book called uh, Prozoro, how a dream became reality. And I'm very proud that uh, two members of our team on, on the first page of it. And, uh, uh, then we switched to transparency and e-democracy policies for Ukrainian cities. And uh, here you can see um, top of uh, trans uh, transparency rating of Ukrainian of top uh, 100 biggest Ukrainian cities. And uh, there is uh, uh, Pokrov and other one is Mariupol. And this is before we worked with them. And this is after. They're number one and number two. So this is how we work with uh, Ukrainian cities to make them more transparent. It was actually 57th and 90, 91st, I guess. Uh, so this is how we work with Ukrainian cities. And uh, we also host one of the platforms, Ukrainian platforms for uh, citizen participations in decision-making for local governments. And we have dozens of uh, local communities uh, using it in Ukraine. Uh, as for anti-corruption, uh, uh, we took active part in, in the formation of uh, new anti-corruption bodies, law enforcement bodies in Ukraine. Uh, I mean National Anti-Corruption Bureau of Ukraine, uh, you probably know it as NABU. And uh, uh, I was three times elected as a member of uh, Civil Oversight Council of NABU. And uh, um, we were in charge of, of the selection of detectives for this institution. And I think we did our work well because uh, not no one of the detec detectives of NABU has been bribed yet. So it's a good achievement for Ukraine. And uh, we conducted our own investigations uh, and saved hundreds of uh, millions of uh, uh, public funds. Uh, but of course, sometimes uh, reaching our goals required street protests and this is my daughter showing uh, her daddy on TV while uh, it was one of such protests and sometimes it goes even like this. Uh, so uh, it's, it's an amazing job, you know. And uh, we host the biggest forum and uh, it's a reforms forum in the region. Its uh, name is Valit Nilza Astatsa and uh, we can translate it uh, into in English like uh, leave not stay, but without comma, okay? Thank you, Nick, for, for this translation. I guess it was your idea. No? <laughs> okay, thank you anyway. <laughs> uh, and of course, uh, Save the Pro Initiative, it's, uh, uh, it fights for environmental rights of Ukrainian people and uh, because sometimes our environmental rights uh, look like, the, like this. This is a real power plant. It's situated uh, right in the middle of my hometown, Dnipro. And uh, we know that the first step for you to solve the problem is to, uh, is to measure it. And this is why we uh, developed such a cute device. 
It's made of very convention of, of very usual materials and it costs very low price and uh, we covered whole Ukraine with uh, such devices uh, uh, using people's activity and now Ukrainians start understanding what they breathe at least. Uh, so we're very proud that we've been recognized as uh, uh, people of new times by one of the Ukrainian magazines and uh, uh, here's actually uh, we're rewarded uh, this award for, for uh, local reforms. And uh, a few days ago, we were rewarded for, as an open data leader award, um, it was uh, uh, Save Nipro and Save EcoBot initiative. So uh, it, was, it would be impossible without my team and those beautiful people, here they are. It's uh, Soil Control team and this is Save Nipro team. And of course, uh, what I'm doing here, what it's all about. Um, you know, <laughs> there's, <laughs> it's like, it's coincidence, Pasha. Uh, uh, what are we doing here? Uh, you know, when I, it, uh, coming here is a very competitive thing. And uh, when I was uh, applying for uh, uh, Emergent Leaders Program, uh, I was told that uh, recommendations weigh heavily. And I started calling my friends. Uh, in government, MPs, just asking them to give me a recommendation. And usually I heard the answer, well, yes, Artem, we can give you a recommendation, but it wouldn't be so fair because then I'm an applicant too. <laughs> so, <laughs> so my goals here are uh, very simple and law enforcement reform is actually Mainly it's about police reform and it's about police reform from human resources perspective. For I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but from human res, uh, resource perspective. And uh, um, uh, the key thing that I remind when, I, when I'm talking about rule of law, about law enforcement, is a Soviet legacy. You know, what, what, what uh, hold us so, uh, and, and this is why I took this thing along. This is a piece of this guy. This guy's name is uh, Vladimir Lenin. And he's standing right, right in the middle of the central square of my hometown. This is what happened with him uh, in 2015. And I would like to present this piece of, uh, piece of Lenin. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> to Center on Democracy, Rule of Law, and uh, to Freeman Spogli Institute, it's written here. It's written here. <laughs> yeah. It's written here that dangerous, it's, it's a dangerous commie virus. So please keep it, keep it in the bottle, okay? <laughs> and goal number two, thank you. Goal number two is uh, air pollution monitoring network development. And I'm going to do one step ahead of this goal right now. This is the device I was talking about. And this is also for CDDRL and for Freeman Spogli Institute for Stanford. And we're going to put it here and just spread our activities to the USA. So thank you. And goal number three, this is also for you. Uh, and goal number three, uh, um, I would like to invite my co-fellows here because it's our like very special thing for us. Uh, it's uh, Ukrainian, Change and Investment Summit at Stanford that we want to hold uh, this uh, spring, actually late uh, April. And uh, we're going to make it unusual Ukrainian event here. Um, and we encourage you to uh, take part. So I know there's many Ukrainians here, so please. And not only Ukrainians. Uh, uh, so we will need your help because our uh, plans are ambitious. Maybe Katarina can add some or Pasha. Can you? <laughs> about, about what our goals here are. So, and we decided to call it Limitless. Yeah. <laughs> what you see here is uh, the name of uh, this big, big Ukrainian event. Uh, and uh, I think it, this name is what characterizes uh, Ukraine now. 
So. Yeah. <laughs> actually, yeah. Actually, this is a very raw version of what we are planning to do, and probably we will give you the details, you know, um, step by step, one by one. And uh, I just want to focus your attention on the fact that this conference or summit is going to be not only for like political discussion. This is also about new opportunities because our country has entered a new stage of its evolution and um, new, we have new governments, we have a lot of creative and young people inside it. So we want to show how many opportunities Ukraine has and this is our main goal actually. So please come, help us in, and join us. in the in organization nice. join. and let's make it happen. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and Thank you. Here's my contacts. You can feel free to contact me anytime. And thank you once again for being so warm. It's time to work a little bit. Physical exercise. Okay, well, it turns out we're right on schedule, so we have a little time uh, for any discussion. Uh, and uh, if anyone in the audience would like to raise any questions of our three new fellows, or, uh, you know, we have other people in the room like uh, Sasha and Slava and so forth. Uh, uh, so the floor is open to any kind of discussion. Should be about Ukraine, but let's open the floor up. Uh, Catherine. Um, well, we're not surprised that our presidents actually communicate, so <laughs> they do. But of course, uh, this, the way uh, our president was uh, mm, expressing his opinions is uh, a little bit shocking. Um, but um, uh, the most, uh, like, we, we found some markers in this situation in, in what Zelensky told. And those markers are, um, are things for us that we must pay attention to. Uh, we, I mean civil society, because when a person says uh, about prosecutor general that this is 100% my person, uh, which is supposed to be independent, it's a kind of, uh, maybe it's not true, but, but it's something that we must pay attention now. So this is how I, for sub the situation, this is uh, how I will react on it. Anyone else? Well, actually, we just share the same opinion. That's why it's hard to add something. <laughs> yes. Uh, why do we think uh, the European community still not recognize project in anti-corruption reform that you mentioned? Project or progress? Progress. Progress? Um, is it still below expectation level? I wouldn't say that they don't recognize because when we do something good, they always say that you did something good. Uh, they're actually, um, there are pretty successful cases in Ukraine. Uh, of course, everything moves very hard and we always fight with some, someone who tries to roll it back. But. Uh, for example, the National Anti-Corruption Bureau case uh, is good appreciated by, by European uh, community and as well as uh, many other cases. Um, but the key thing here is that maybe s so very often it happens not because of governmental efforts, but because of international efforts, international pressure and uh, pressure from inside, from the active civil society. So this is maybe uh, the thing what worries the most, uh, usually, our, our uh, European partners. 
Um, yes. Hi, uh, good afternoon. My name is Justin. I am a master's student in the Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies program. I recently moved back after living in Armenia for two years, a country that's also recently undergone a revolution. And I suppose my question to you is what advice would you give to other new generations in the former Soviet space that are changing their definitions of what is a fair society, what does anti-corruption mean, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Well, my probably advice would be always take a chance. So when there is a window of opportunity, you should do uh, the most that you can do. And of course, well, from my own experience, from what I can advise, just um, try to get good relations with the entire world and international partners. Sometimes it really helps. If you can't make something happen from inside, just try to involve international partners, international organizations. Sometimes they can really help to push through some things that are really crucial. And this is what I experienced in pension reform and some other initiatives. And this is what we have now, actually. Um, for example, the IMF position on all this private bank stuff, etc. So it keeps the reforms, it, it prevents the reforms to go back and just to move forward. And I'd like to add, uh, if you don't mind, um, that you must be ready for implementing changes because in 2014, most of us were not ready. And it was like uh, a distance, you're, you're starting a run and you don't even know where you run to. So just, just finding it out uh, during the run. And uh, the second thing is, is uh, build the institutions. So if, uh, uh, again, this case of National Anti-Corruption Bureau, why it stands? Because uh, uh, in 2015, such people as uh, Alexandra Ustinova and many civil activists and people from uh, inside the government, they, they built the institution that became pretty independent. And this is why every try to uh, replace director or, for example, uh, make it uh, uh, useless, just it, it failed. So the institutions weigh heavily. If I could uh, add a little comment on that question, because it's something that I think we at CDDRL have been thinking a lot about. Uh, we do a lot of work with civil society activists, and I think in democracy promotion, uh, which the United States does through institutions like the National Endowment for Democracy, uh, which I am a board member, I've been proud to be a board member almost for two decades of that organization, uh, a lot of the emphasis has been on you know, getting the dictator out uh, and getting to that moment that you know, was achieved in the Revolution of Dignity where dictator gets on an airplane and flies out of the country, but it's been pretty clear that that's only the beginning of the struggle. Uh, Ukraine had its first opportunity in the Orange Revolution in 2004 and completely screwed it up uh, because there was no follow through. The government that replaced you know, the, the, the fleeing dictator didn't know how to govern. It was itself very corrupt uh, and it all collapsed on itself and the dictator came back. And that, unfortunately, has been a pattern in many uh, democratic transitions. And so I think one of the things that we've been trying to do is actually to encourage um, civil activists that are outside of the government to actually go into government once that transition happens because democracy is not just op about opposing tyrannical government. It's also about governing, using power uh, in a democratic fashion. And that's why it's, you know, in many cases, it's been a struggle to persuade somebody who is a journalist or who is running an NGO uh, and is used to protesting the government to, to actually run for parliament or go into the bureaucracy. Uh, I think there's a feeling that politics is extremely dirty and corrupting and you don't want to lose, you know, you don't want to make a, a break with, with, you know, things that you're comfortable with. 
But I think one of the great things about this program and also the Draper Hill Summer Fellows Program that we, you know, we, we, it's, a, it's another one at CDDRL where we bring mostly civil society activists to Stanford every year for uh, three weeks in the summer. Um, you know, a lot of those people actually have made that transition, not just in Ukraine, but in Georgia, in Malaysia, in, you know, many other uh, parts of the world where, you know, people are struggling to build a democracy. And so that's certainly the uh, advice we've been giving and, and the advice I would generally give, that you really need to work on making that transition and actually figuring out how the mechanism of government uh, works. So yes. uh, my name is Ethan. Um, I have a PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford, and I work as a software engineer. And actually, the reason I came to this event is because of the Ukraine question. So my question is for Francis. Uh, in your opinion, just your opinion, what are the chances that A, Trump is impeached, B, he is removed, C, that that affects in any way, shape, and form the people who voted for him in 2016, people like myself who were fed up with the corruption in Washington? Well, <laughs> this is supposed to be a discussion about Ukraine, and um, I, I'm not sure that this is really the appropriate, you know, place to discuss American politics. Uh, you know, it's a it's an interesting moment, um, uh, and I think that one one of the important things uh, that we're trying to do in this program is actually to try to understand. Um, what corruption really is and who is actually guilty of it. Uh, and so your statement that, you know, right now, you know, you have this extremely corrupt system in Washington and that's the thing that we're trying to get rid of, it's complicated. It's more complicated than that. Uh, and I think the one thing that, you know, we're trying to do today and in this program is actually to try to educate people a little bit about, um, you know, who is corrupt and what is not. I think that's what Sasha Ustinova was trying to explain with regard to uh, Ukraine because there's been a lot of misinformation about it. But I, I really want to avoid a discussion of American politics. I have a follow so, up to that. No, no, I'm sorry. Let's let's go over here. Hi, I'm uh, Nick Bilogorsky, one of the volunteers for Nova Ukraine, uh, the largest Ukrainian charity on the West Coast. And my question is, I travel to Ukraine often and I still see one of the biggest hurdles for it moving forward is that uh, people are divided on many issues. It's a country divided on Russia versus Ukraine, on, on corruption. Uh, what do you think we can do to come up with an idea or message uh, to help rally people around a certain cause? And do you think they, will, they can unite around certain personalities or they can rely, uh, unite around certain uh, upcoming milestones? Like, do you see that as a problem? Um, and what can we all do to help? Is it me? Maybe? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I can answer it if you want. Okay. Yeah. Well, first of all, as Pasha said, we don't have this strategic communication from the government. This is why all the populism is possible, and this is why it comes up. We have too many resources now and social media to reach people's mind, and this is why it's good that plurality of uh, opinions is good, but we don't have this uh, message from the government. We don't have this uh, national idea, you know, like one, like one brand which unites people around one uh, or like a set of values, common values. So from my point of view, we need to work on this strategic communication and, you know, when time goes, it, it will change the situation. We need to form a common set of values shared by everyone from east to west, from south to north, whatever. So it's going to be like a uniting point. And this is what we are missing and lacking now. So we're going to solve this problem. Pasha? Yeah, yeah. Pasha. Yeah, definitely. Pasha will do it. Just wait for, for 10 months. <laughs> and a little bit more than 10 months. <laughs> Do you want to add anything? Thanks so much. Uh, my name is Yaroslav Arznyuk. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur, Ukrainian entrepreneur, living in the United States for the last five years. My question is about what Ukraine can do uh, for the world. So this is called the Ukrainian Emerging Leaders Program. Hopefully these leaders will not only lead inside of Ukraine, but also outside of it. And there are many issues the world is facing, including many crises, including probably democracy crisis, one can argue. 
So what are the things people from Ukraine have unique that they can offer to the world? Um, I know Pavel was, was talking about uh, creativity and we can talk about many things and, and export and like steel and all that stuff. But what are the things you are personally uh, mostly excited about? Tell us about that. Yeah, I like that you said like creativity, like this is something small. No, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> add creative, more creativity to the world. It's really big deal. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's very good if we can do and we have this energy and courage so I think the creativity is really big, big, big thing. And it will be enough if we will only improve world creativity from Ukraine. Uh, Slava? Yes, uh, uh, I have a question to all three of, of you guys. Um, Here, why don't you get the microphone? So, so talking about creativity, uh, we see a lot of so-called creativity in politics, me and Sasha and Rostev now. So this is the most uh, popular word now, we should be creative. <laughs> and, uh, we see it in Rada every day. And uh, my question is, uh, so do you think, and, and also you've, you've, you've used a very popular in Ukraine expression now, a wind of opportunity. And everybody literally is talking about wind of opportunity and uh, uh, the fear to, squander it and and kind of uh, kind of very let's say people are very obsessed with wind of opportunity so my question is uh, so how much creative should you be in politics having this wind of opportunity and what do you think is more important uh, now when we talk about country uh, to do things as fast as possible because we have this wind of opportunity or probably to sacrifice some, you know, some v velocity or speed of reforms mm, in order to establish everything properly and sticking with the rules. So what's more important, rules or political mm, wind of opportunity? And this is a very simple question, but unfortunately, there is no one answer in Ukrainian politics now, so I'm interested in yours. Well, there actually is one answer, one simple answer, and you know it, and we discussed it uh, uh, a few days ago. So the rules are more important, it's obvious for me, but uh, b because sometimes it's r there are really situations when uh, the speed of uh, your movement is more important than uh, the quality of what you do it. It's, for example, when you are uh, producing an MVP product. Uh, uh, it, it, it was, w it, this is exactly what was done when uh, uh, Prozoro system, public e-procurement system started uh, working. So it was an MVP and uh, it, it st started to, to be tested uh, in, uh, uh, one of the uh, one of the ministries, and then it uh, proceeded to local level. And um, but it was not a fundamental thing. It was uh, only about uh, public procurement. Uh, so to me, the most important things thing is uh, uh, the rules and. If you, if you don't manage to build proper rules and, and follow them, then everybody after you will just continue, continue and continue violating them. It's very simple because it's never, uh, changes never come from, from the bottom. Well, from the bottom comes revolutions. And changes, real changes and real reforms come from the high, so uh, people in government, president, MPs, uh, and government must show how to do, and they must obey the rules. That's my point. Well, I do agree. I do agree that rules are the key in reforms implementation, but the speed also matters. Why? Because many changes that many changes that you are trying to implement, and if you leave the time for old system to adapt then it's much harder you know, to move forward. Especially, like for example, everyone is asking, how can we fight the oligarchs? 
Spain in Ukraine. How can we fight? For example, we, we can create a competition for them. If we invite multinational companies, international business, etc., they will need to adapt to these competitive things. So the speed also matters, you know, and if you move quite fast, you can leave no chance for old and corrupted things, you know, because they lose this uh, fight in this compete for, uh, in this compete for, to be, uh, to be on the, yeah, I see that you have a question. No, 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 I just, uh, no, I didn't question that speed is important. I, the question was sim much more simple. What is more important? What is more important? Okay, what I would give preference still for institutions and rules because this is the basis. This is the basis. But what matters is how fast we can build them. Yeah, it's a tough question, question personally for me because I hate to wait something. So if you have to for <laughs> institutions, so I will be for speed. <laughs> we'll I'm a big fan of MVP, <laughs> do something, get feedback, improve, and then go. Well, so yeah, I think the times. Important. <laughs> Steve. Thank you. Um, I look at Ukraine today and I see Ukraine with a young president, a very young prime minister, a cabinet which, where I think the average age is about 35. And I see two parties in the, p in the parliament which have young leaders, including the gentleman on my left. And I see three other parties which are headed by you know, people who I would say were really products of or they had their formative years in the Soviet system. They had the opposition bloc, the Timoshenko bloc, the um, Poroshenko bloc. So when you're looking at the politics of the kind of changes that you're talking about, how much should we see this really as a generational struggle? Uh, <laughs> Slava Slo wants to answer. <laughs> <laughs> As, as I can't answer, but it was the question for... for no, wait, go ahead, if you want to answer. So, okay, I, I, I will say. So I, I think it's only partly generational question, because you described it, uh, you described the division uh, in like one dimension. So this is like the question of the old parties and the new parties. But believe me, there are other dimensions, and we see a lot of... Uh, similarities, some similarities and some common things with old MPs and old parties, suddenly much less than, uh, uh, I would say, di differences. But also we see a lot of differences with the MPs who are new and who are supposed to be uh, those, like uh, this new fresh air of Ukrainian politics. It's not, when you see it very, uh, look at it very, very attentively, you sometimes can see uh, a lot of signs that some of these new are actually uh, not as new as you think they are. And uh, this is a very important thing, and uh, I think it's a big threat for Ukrainian politics now. And why me and Sasha and uh, Rostam and others people in our party are so obsessed with rules now, uh, with institutions, because we think that uh, the rules and institution, they give you a a basis, you know, a foundation on which you can stand, and then the new generations can only bring really kind of new creativity. And so it's it's great to be creative when you stand on rules. Even in, I think, in arts, which I also represent in Pasha, we have fundamental rules. And this is not how you paint or how you compose music, but, I mean, general rules on what art or entertainment or, uh, you know, uh, uh, business of advertising is. The same in politics. And what worries me personally, that uh, sometimes the flag or the mask, the mask of new face uh, disguise, unfortunately, uh, old methods. Uh, and it's still present in parliament. So this is the biggest challenge for Ukrainian politi politics now. So it, it really has, we have really, we have really a big, uh, we really have a big uh, window of opportunity now because nobody can uh, argue that it's unprecedented that Ukrainian politics, uh, politics changed so 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 rapidly and so fundamentally for like 80% of MPs are new and uh, 
like you know the president is completely is is an outcomer and all these kind of things so it's it's certainly a window of opportunity but if this window of opportunity is this window will not be you know based on on good gear which is institutions and rules it can be easily blown by wind and there will be no window at all uh, and sometimes i also say about speed of uh, when you have a window of opportunity and you work, do something fast, make sure that you won't uh, uh, kind of uh, go away, out, go out from window and just uh, fall down from it. So it's very important. Even window of opportunity, it's just only window, it's not doors. So this is what I want to say. <laughs> yes. Thank you. How about right here? Hi, my name is Julia. Uh, I'm representing nonprofit organization called Ukraine Global Scholars, and talking about generations actually. Uh, so, um, you know, Ukrainian Emerging Leaders Program. Obviously, Ukraine Global Scholars are believer in Western education. Um, at the same time, there are just 2,000 Ukrainians studying in, in the United States. Uh, among those 2,000, you can find uh, 52 wonderful alumni of Ukraine Global Scholars studying in. Ivy League schools right now, uh, you know, um, free of charge, and some of them are actually here. You have uh, you have Anastasia Malenka, uh, who is getting her bachelor degree at Stanford. Uh, you have Igor Barakayev, who traveled all the way from he's from Kirovograd. He traveled all the way from Boston actually to be here and to listen to you guys. You have five Minerva students, Ukrainian Minerva students, here today in the room. Actually, they're. 19 Minerva students, Ukrainian Minerva students this year, the biggest cohort of Ukrainians. Um, and th they are looking at you. Um, my question is actually, uh, do you have any advice for them as a young generation? So they are 17, 18, 19 years old. Uh, what kind of advice you would give uh, to them? And they will all come back to Ukraine at some point because this is the contract they signed with us as Ukraine Global Scholars. Thank you. Yeah, I have. Yeah, one maybe dangerous device, but don't be too smart. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's it's really really easy to become too smart. Yeah, so I think now we all need like to be alive, to be open, to be free, and because I think it's too easy to become too smart. This is dangerous. <laughs> Um, uh, I actually, uh, I have already told today that uh, my main point is be ready. Please be ready for your time in Ukraine. Uh, actually, the first advice was uh, come back to Ukraine. But uh, you told that uh, uh, you signed a contract, so you're, you will come back to Ukraine. And please. Uh, <laughs> so. I hope it works. So please be ready. Uh, it's well. I, I've already told about this because it, it's something that uh, uh, that made many people die in Ukraine in 2014 and uh, and after 2004 and 2014. Because maybe if we would be ready more than we were, uh, maybe we could avoid those victims. Um, so. Uh, and, and one more thing maybe is all that you are seeing here is, uh, I mean, here at Stanford or uh, at, in the, this Bay Area is uh, something unique. You see this overlap of technology and policy making and uh, uh, research and everything here, and business, and startups, and everything here is closely tied. It's very unlikely. It, it, it's very unlike Ukraine. And this is why these uh, people that are here are so successful. So please, um, uh, please um, learn how to do this in, in Ukraine. Please uh, change Ukrainian education approaches, and then. Uh, okay, I can talk uh, no. uh, <laughs> about an hour about it. <laughs> so. may, I, may, okay. I also, may I also add one advice from me? Um, be yourself. Just not forget who you really are. Because you are taught some stuff at the universities, you are 
learning in the cool universities, they give you the best, the best education, the best knowledge you can get. But when you get back to Ukraine, you will face the reality. And in this reality, please try to find your place. Listen to yourself. What do you want to do? What are your strongest interests? What are your strongest points? Like, I don't know, even the character and everything. Just try, don't try to fit somewhere. Be yourself, find your place. And this is where you will succeed. Because, well, from my experience, I tried a lot of stuff before I found the things that really interesting and where I can succeed. So, yes, use your knowledge. Yes, use your background. But please, don't forget to be yourself and find your particular place. And then you're going to be the most effective and happy. That's it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, I think we have time for just one more question. How about the uh, gentleman all the way in the back there? Hello. Uh, hi, my name is Anton. I'm a software engineer here in Silicon Valley, also from Ukraine originally. Um, so I have a question, uh, actually to Slava, kind of. Um, <laughs> but you can also, I mean, it's okay. kind of to everyone. So you talked about the importance of uh, institutions, but it's not a secret that Ukraine is um, not a strong enough country to kind of always protect its institutions hard enough from the kind of influences from other countries like Russia, I mean, US as well, or Europe, regardless of what your political views are. So my question is, um, Ukraine being not some, somewhat reliant on, uh, let's say, the gas prices that Russia can kind of tweak the way it wants to kind of influence uh, if it doesn't like what Ukraine is doing, or like, um, you know, the communication between Trump and uh, Ukraine. How would you, how do you think the new government um, can protect itself from these influences and how can it protect its institutions that it's trying to build if this is in, these institutions are not, you know, as, um, like not supporting the ideas of someone else who is a bit more powerful at, at this point than Ukraine is. <laughs> Thank you. I don't have a mic, so. Can you hear me like that? Yes. Okay, so uh, this is a very... This is a very concrete and smart question. And uh, all smart questions don't have, uh, you know, uh, concrete answers usually, but I will try to answer you uh, as fully as I can. So, uh, first of all, regarding gas prices, uh, Ukraine so far today is not dependent heavily on, uh, on Russian gas at the extent that it used to be to have before, and especially because of the reforms that have been made during former government as well. Uh, during the last four years, and certainly, so this is kind of sustainable reforms that I'm talking about and rules. So something that the previous government made, which was good, should be implemented and used by the new government, and then the new government, because these are good things. This is like in Darwin theory. So all the best species survive. So the best species of, of uh, reforms and rules should survive and strengthen the falling. Uh, then generally, uh, I think uh, what government and the president and uh, the parliament should do is to show example to the world that those rules that work well should work no matter happens. Those rules which recommended themselves as some bad rules and there are evidences that these, uh, these rules or these you know, habits uh, led to some real big problems should be replaced by, but once again, using the rule of law, constitution and procedures. So this is very simple in theory, but very difficult in practice uh, method that I should urge everybody, starting from the president and uh, also MPs and also uh, government use. So when you come to the office, don't treat everything that was done before like some garbage you need, that you need to throw away. Don't treat all the rules that have been uh, made before, the just rules that constrain you in order not to make good things. Sometimes rules are annoying and I would say uh, they really constrain you, but before you know, violating them, think even with good intentions, 
think twice why are they, uh, these rules are there. And in our party, we have a, uh, I'm sorry that I'm kind of kind of making it not impartial, but it's very important. In our party, we, we have a interesting marker that we use in order uh, wh when we discuss are we going to vote for or against some amendment on some new draft law. So we call it Yanukovych factor. So uh, probably everybody know who Yanukovych is. He was an infamous former president of Ukraine who fled after the revolution of dignity and, we are, and he is now badly wanted in Ukraine as a prisoner. So uh, when we have this draft, we analyze if Yanukovych was the president and in power, would we support and vote for this law or would we vote against? And this is very simple but very powerful marker, which says, gives you the idea what institution is. So it doesn't matter if the president today is the best person in the world and he or she wants, like, you know, really to make the biggest breakthrough in the universe or you have somebody who is corrupt and really wanting only to make some money for himself or his family, it doesn't matter for the rule of law. That's what I'm trying to say, and for institutions. You don't count on the name of a person, you count on the logic of the law and how uh, strategically, uh, in the long run, how this or that law will implement, uh, will, sorry, will be it will influence Ukraine and Ukraine and, and will this law make Ukraine happier or better place to live? And if you use this factor, you will see how um, so so how obvious you make decisions that you don't make without this factor. Because the temptation uh, to say, look, we've been waiting for 28 years. So there's no time to wait, let's do it, whatever, uh, by, by whatever means we, we can, the temptation is very high. And it is very, very important not to follow this temptation because that's what, where institutions erode. That's when they get corrupted and that's way where the country becomes weak because there's something that needs to, to put us all you know, together. So, uh, once again, short answer. The more we are focused in building um, strong institutions and also transparent rules, the more transparent, the more simple and the more just all these rules are, the more difficult for every, any other country which doesn't like our country, like Russia, for example, will be to, to make some harm to us. I think that the the fact that Ukraine didn't have these strict rules and strict but just and very simple rules and institutions before led to the fact of 2013 revolution of dignity and then to annexation of Crimea and the war, war in Donbass. And now we need to not to follow this mistake. And I think this is our task and also the task of these wonderful guys and of these wonderful students that I see here. So we need all, we need to build a foundation for the country, rules, principles and institutions. And then no matter who is in power, we'll be following these rules and institutions and we'll be doing some progress. And that's very, that's, that's not a trick, that's not rocket science actually. Theoretically, but practically, not everybody can do it. Okay, thanks. Uh, so we're actually a little bit over time. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody here for coming today. I'd like to thank our uh, emerging leaders and welcome them once again to Stanford. Uh, we are going to have another big event uh, in the spring, so please stay tuned because I hope uh, many of you will be able to come back then. Uh, and um, I also want to uh, acknowledge my colleague, Sasha Jason, who's the manager of our program for all the work that she's done. Uh, so I believe we have a reception outside, oh, no, I'm sorry, the reception is in the courtyard uh, right outside this room, and so I invite you to uh, come and uh, meet our emerging leaders uh, in person. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Good work. Давай, да.
Yeah. 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 Let's make a picture. Um, picture. Photographer. You did. Oh. Really good job. Thank you. Great. Good work. So let's, let's do all the fellows with Frank and then huh? all the fellows with Frank. Microphone is Okay. Sasha? Don't, don't let our donors vanish.